we want to thank God for the media ministry and we just give God praise for what you continue to do in all of our lives in spite of all things you are in the midst and you have kept us and provided for us and all made ways for us and so we thank you so tonight we need to hear word from you a different kind of word God that you have given and so we ask always that you will move by your spirit we pray if there's anyone that does not know in the pardoning of their sins that they will accept Christ they will rededicate their faith if need be and join the Ebenezer Amy Church so we ask God that you just have your way pour down your spirit have your way move by your spirit in this Wednesday night Bible study service and we bless your name now always for the opportunity to serve you and to serve God's people in Jesus name we pray amen we praise the Lord on tonight as as we always want to thank you uh, each of you the Ebenezer Church family and the streaming church family for tuning in uh, tonight as we have journeyed now for so many weeks and so many months and uh, for first time persons um, this this is our Wednesday night Bible study evening maybe somebody told you or you were surfing the web and you heard about it and, and so we want to say thank you we have been on a journey and studying the Apostle letters uh, to the church for a few a couple of months now and so we want to thank God you can always go on Facebook live um, and you can go Ebony my Ebenezer Amy dot org and you can you can also look back at some of the other teachings that have take place have taken place as every Christian knows that this is the Advent season of the Christian church and it is time it is the time that Christian churches and Christian believers all over the world focus in on the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ it is a time as Christians when we celebrate the gift of the baby Jesus coming into the world through the womb of Mary a young peasant girl it is as you know a miracle story and so tonight we are going to quickly I don't know how quick we're going to be but we're going to look at Paul's letter at 1st Corinthians the 11th chapter and the second through the 16th verses that's 1st Corinthians the 11th chapter and the second through the 16th verses and we're going to and you need to walk with me and listen to because we're going to marriage if you will the Christmas story and and some of the scriptures in uh, 1st Corinthians the second chapter um, chapter not the check and second chapter I'm sorry chapter 11 and the second through the 16th verses stick with me this evening uh, as we walk with the Lord and hear what the Lord wants to teach us all on this evening for those of you that may be wondering why in this Advent season I am not teaching from the synoptic Gospels and the stories that occurred leading to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ please open yourselves up tonight and allow the Lord to reveal through the teaching tonight what he wants to say let me just preface the teaching on tonight with what what it meant for the baby Jesus to enter the world and the importance and significance that is far reaching in our lives on today as Christians the baby Jesus breaking into time and history through the womb of a woman should speak volumes to every woman and to every man the baby Jesus breaking into time and history over 2020 years ago through the life giving womb of a young peasant girl named Mary is significantly and profoundly important and this incredible miracle story in the faith ought to speak volumes to every area of our lives this story of the baby Jesus that we all know as Christians that we hear over and over again is a story that fulfills the plan of God that was planned before the beginning of time for when sin entered in when we read Genesis in the eating of the fruit from the tree of good and evil the plan was then set in motion immediately by God to bring us back to the intimate relationship that God intended for all of us to have I mean I am teaching tonight what we call in seminary systematic theology systematic theology is the discipline of Christian theology that formulates orderly 
rational, and coherent information of the Christian faith. Systematic theology is what we take in seminary. It connects the dots in biblical history and what it all means for us today. That's what pastor is so phenomenal with, taking the Bible and connecting the dots. And that is why on tonight you have to stick with me and walk with me and listen to what the Lord is saying and where the Lord is taking us. I know, as I have indicated before, we like to rush through things. We live in that time. We, we like to Google what we need and quickly move through things and information. And I understand that. But in this case, in Bible study on Wednesday nights, we must take our time. It must be a life-changing information and insight of the Word of God. I think that the Lord in this season is reconnecting us during COVID to relearn how to be patient and to be still and to listen and to settle down and to hear him speak to all of us. Sin stepped in, excuse me, stepped in, and when it did in Genesis, the woman, hear me now, was labeled through interpretation as the initial example of disobedience and the reason why sin stepped into God's creation. And she, the woman, had influenced Adam to take of the fruit. Three, two, a couple of significant points I need to bring up. One is, in that Genesis story, Adam, the man, was there at the time and did not speak up nor stop the act of sin, of eating of the fruit from the tree of good and evil. He was there. Read it for yourself. Number two, a woman does have godly influence. It is innately given to us. <clears throat> All that to say, my sisters and my brothers on tonight, that they both were equally disobedient. But the truth is that from that Genesis story, from the pulpit, for many generations, not this pulpit, but others, I knew I grew up in it, I heard it, the significance and the importance and the forgiving and the love that God had and continues to have for men and women, it's important to embrace on this Christian journey. However, the forgiveness that the God of our salvation has for women sometimes has been diminished. And the Christian church has used that story and other stories in the word of God as a form of oppression. Hear me tonight. <clears throat> this teaching is for all of us, men and women, to be set free. If we have uh, 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 any misunderstandings of the word of God for all of God's creation due to the misunderstanding and the lack of knowledge of God's word and the misinterpretation of God's word, I know for myself how the word of God has been used to oppress me. I can raise my hand. And so some of the biblical stories of the Old Testament have undergirded oppression, has influenced and impacted. It has, it has rooted out of the Jewish culture and traditions in biblical days, and it's oppressed men and it's oppressed women. And the Christian church, the black Christian church, has used the Genesis story along with the word of God from Genesis to Revelation to oppress women for generations. But the truth is that the baby Jesus came to liberate us all and to set us all free from physical and spiritual chains, uh, chains of sins and oppression. And it is clearly written both in Old Testament and New Testament why Jesus came and, and why he came and why he did what he did. In Isaiah 61, 1, the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Mark 5, 1 through 20 and Luke 4, 14 through 21, it is confirmed why Jesus came into the world. These are just some of the scriptures. The Old Testament scripture in Isaiah 61, 1, and throughout the 61st chapter are scriptures that are considered the advents of the Messiah scriptures, meaning the scriptures that were written 
in preparation of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, coming into the world. Isaiah 61.1 says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me. This is back in Isaiah, Old Testament. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good news unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And in Luke 4, 14, 21, Jesus is on the scene as a man and starting at the 16th verse in the ninth, to the 19th verses, it is reinforced why the baby Jesus came into the world. And it is written, verse number 16 of Luke, and he, meaning Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue in the Sabbath day and stood up for read. Verse number 17, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, the scripture I just read. And when he had opened the book, <clears throat> he found the place where it was written. Verse number 13, 18, I'm sorry, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel, same scripture as in Isaiah, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible said that in that 20th verse that Jesus closed the book, and then he sat down. The birth of the baby Jesus was a plan of not only redemption, saving and forgiving us from our sins, but it was also to heal and to set and to liberate those who were captive and oppressed. Therefore, why then has the church been an instrument of oppression? Why has the church been a place and space to reinforce man's influence and interpretation of the word of God? Why and how come man used the word of God to reinforce slavery of black people to prevent women to be all that God has ever wanted them to be? And the church has supported oppression, racism, and social injustice. Why? I want to contend tonight that the same enemy, the law, the woman and Adam, is the same enemy that is always at work to go against the ultimate plan of God. For when the baby Jesus entered the world through a peasant girl named Mary, who had to flee to Bethlehem to birth, to birth the Son of God, our Savior, to the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ to this very day, evil has and is ever present and working against the plan of God for his creation. In this Advent season, I, I want to land tonight in scripture that has been used to also oppress women in the church in various dominant denominations and still exist today. It is the scripture that pastors and leaders in church houses that have, have been used that is antiquated and has, and is, and has impacted and, in, and has been impacted and influenced by Jewish and Eastern cultures. And some of the scriptures were, we are looking at tonight has been instituted in churches and denominations to the degree <clears throat> that if it is not done, a, a woman cannot come to the altar to take communion and kneel and pray if her head is not covered. The baby Jesus in this Advent season did not come to keep women or anyone from being able to kneel and pray and take communion because she did not have her head covered with a hat or a scarf or a veil or have a dolly on her head or even men having long hair. There are many reasons why it is believed that women must have their heads covered in the church in biblical days. The scripture in 1 Corinthians, the second through the 16th verses, has been used to oppress women that Paul wrote and yet the baby Jesus came to set us free. Now for some, the weight of this text, how much it has weight on us of this text, and others like it, they may not, it, it may not impact you, but for those of you 
who have ever felt oppression in the church or for anyone, from anyone, who, who may not have liked what was said about women or for any man that may be locked into defining the woman's place in the kingdom of God because of what was said from the pulpit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want the Lord to set us all free from any bondage or oppression or thoughts that are contrary to why Jesus came into the world. There are leaders in the Christian church. I'm going to get in trouble, but it's all right. I'm going down the lane because I know I'm supposed to. There are leaders in the Christian church who refuse to recognize and acknowledge and affirm the call of ministry on their wives' lives. I am so grateful for my honey bunny. I'm honey bunny Jones to him, but he's honey bunny bunny to me. Who recognized the call on my life and prayed for me for two years, never saying a thing to me. He knew all along for two years and he didn't say a thing to me until the night that I got my license to preach in the basement of Hemingway Memorial AME Church where my pastor, the Reverend Dr. William R. Porter was my pastor and Mrs. Porter, the first lady of that church. And my pastor, Reverend Dr. William Porter, so supported the calling that I had on my life and he, <clears throat> he understood my struggle as being a woman and I don't know what I would have been. It was that night in March now almost 40 years ago, I was told that because of me, by the presiding elder, elder at that time, which was presiding elder Walter E. Hildebrand, who is the father in ministry of our beloved elder, presiding elder Ronald E. Braxton. But presiding elder Walter Hildebrand told me that night, as I stood before him, preachers of the gospel in Amy Church with my discipline in my Bible, my hymnal book, that being a woman, it was not going to be easy and people were not going to accept me. But thanks be to God, because of Jesus, I kept on pressing forward and because I had a husband who covered me in prayer. I also want to thank you, Ebenezer Church family, for opening yourselves up to female pastoral and ministerial leadership. Jesus came that we all might be liberated and set free. The emerging of liberation theology by many theologians like James Cone, who was uh, an AME uh, theologian and others, came from the revelation, the insight and understanding from the Lord and study. <clears throat> excuse me, that the word of God through limited understanding has been used to reinforce slavery and the oppression of God's people and women for generations. And that the coming of the baby Jesus, the life of Jesus, the suffering, the dying, and the resurrection of Jesus was not to oppress God's people or to hold God's people and women in bondage, but he came so that we all could be set free and have life and have it more abundantly, that we would be free from anything that held us in bondage. He came to forgive us of our sins, but he also came for the season that we are in to set our souls free. The Advent season is a time to celebrate that because of the baby Jesus coming, through a woman, birth in a dirty, smelly manger, <laughs> in swaddling clothes. That major, manger scene was a clear, powerful, and profound statement from God that all of us matter in the sight of God. For God to orchestrate the baby Jesus to be born in a manger must say volumes to us as a people in our history and today with all that is going on and that no one has the right to hold us in bondage because of a culture, historical or denominational reasons or someone's confusion and conclusion in their own minds that they created within themselves. That no one, hear me now, has the right to
to think that they are better, a better people, because they are of another hue, that, that, that people of color are beneath them, and that they treat others differently because they don't look like them as, and treat us as inferior and for, in their own minds that they feel like they are superior. I hope you're with me on tonight. The enemy will use anything in any time in history that he can even uh, in one's religion or faith to try to stop and, and prevent and reinforce negativity and diminish who we are for his own ultimate gain as opposed to what our ultimate purpose is in life because we are created in God's image. We see it today after the elections. A sidebar. Uh, there are so many women who have not been able to step into their purpose or their passion because of sexism in the church, in the workplace, because of men and women who are not knowledgeable of the context in which the word of God was written. Persons have taken the word and oppressed women and, and men because of narrowness and oppressive thinking, because of the skin color, because of our skin color. The baby Jesus in this Advent season came for us to be liberated and set free. And for generations, persons have used the word of God to keep God's people in bondage. In the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 11, the second through the 16th verses, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. Remember, those of you who have been journeying with us, that the city of Corinth is a, is a wild place. Wild. The people are wild. And it was known for outlandish behavior among its people. Paul starts off with this 11th chapter in verse number two that is really a letter to with, uh, with encouraging the people in Corinth to live a life that he has shown them, that he has imitated for them. Let's read verses three through 10, NIV, for your hearing. Verse number three. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is a man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head was shaved. Verse number six, if a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she could cover, she should cover her head. Verse number seven, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Verse number eight, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Verse number nine, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Verse number 10, for this reason, because of the angels, the women, woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. First, I want to establish that Paul's letter is responding to the context, both culturally and biblically, of the early Christian church in the city of Corinth. In the beginning, in verse number three, it is a starting point concerning the conduct of women in the church. The principle that Paul is stating rests in the headship of Christ in the relationship that the believer should have with Christ. But Paul moved in his, his understanding the relationship of the man and woman and husband and wife and the family. The man is to love his wife as Jesus loved the church and he loved the church so much so he died for the church. Sometimes that is left out. This is the understanding. The people don't teach that. Hear me. The man is to love the woman, his wife, as Jesus loved the church. But the next part of the scripture in the word of God is that Jesus loved the church so much he died for it. This is the understanding of marriage in biblical days. And in many instances, it is still taught today. So much has changed since biblical days. And I dare say, I'm getting ready to go somewhere. Some of y'all going to go with me and some of y'all might turn, but stay with me. So much has changed since biblical days, and I dare say the word of God has been used at times to oppress, define, and keep women from finding their place and their purpose in the kingdom. 
I know there might be some discussion and disagreement, and that is okay. We have a mind. That's good. But I know from my own journey that there were times when my role was being defined by persons and their own understanding of the word and not my personal relationship with the Lord Jesus the Christ. I use myself as an example. Let me make it clear. There is order in my house, but my calling into ministry was between me and the Lord. My husband had nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with my calling. I did not get a, a, a yes from him. I didn't have to have a yes from him to accept my calling. And that is why it grieves my spirit with women who I can sense have a calling on their life from God cannot walk in their calling because of those they love, cannot embrace what God has spoken in the woman's spirit. He's spoken it, but they can't move forward because those don't, persons don't agree. Once again, I thank God for my honey bun, my soulmate, my best friend that the Lord sent to me and me to him in a pancake house. This letter is addressing what was going on in Corinth. And there are biblical scholars who wrote that when Paul was writing this letter, as I have said before, before he, oft, before, he oftentimes would be writing what was relevant and what was needed for the people, in this case, for the women in the early church in Corinth. In the, and the biblical scholars as I did my research, also indicated that what the Apostle Paul wrote in this case in other situations does not necessarily relate to the reality of today. And sometimes, because Paul, I know what some of you are saying, the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But Paul was a man, he was not Jesus. And sometimes, because Paul was writing in response to the context and addressing the issues of the times, for today, what he wrote can be considered, in some cases, outdated and antiquated. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul was addressing the problems in Corinth concerning women having the right to participate in service without their veils over their heads and their covering that women of biblical days wore. The veil during that time was a sign of being inferior to a man. The veil during that time was an indication that a woman was in the presence of someone who was superior to herself. Hear me now. In the household in biblical days and in a marriage on today, the man was not only the head of the household, but he had the final word in all things. It was a time when the woman, to be quiet, did not have to say have any say to matters on hand. She did not have an opinion. Man was created to be protector and provider, and woman was created as a nurturer by nature. Those, that's true. But the reality of today is not that man should not be protector and provider, but in many cases, the woman may have an income that is more than her husband, and that is okay because it is for the family. A man in these days may be a father at the home taking care of the children, and that is okay. In these days, a wife does not give her, a, 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 in these days, a wife does give her opinion. She does give her suggestions, and as a concern of family matters. But in biblical days, she did not. She does not idly sit quietly without having input and having discussion. What Paul was saying, not only what a woman was to not say in the church or in the home, was what were antiquated ideas. The man these days do not always have the final word. And women are not being able to contribute to the matter at hand going to create some problems. This is a different day and a different time. The bottom line for a man and woman, husband and wife, 
is that Christ needs to always be the head in your marriage and in your relationship. And so the Apostle Paul is dealing with the issue in public worship that the woman could not be unveiled or covered and the man could not be had to be could not be veiled but the woman had to be veiled she could not be unveiled but a man could not be veiled it was an indication of cultural disorder in biblical times and and in biblical history and in this day and time the covering of one's head in worship it is antiquated the instituting of the subjection of women and the presence uh, in worship of men being superior and women being inferior is outdated and not of God. Let me teach you a moment of what the veil on the woman's head meant then. The woman of Eastern culture wore a yashmak, which has a long veil, leaving only the forehead and the eyes uncovered. Biblically, study has indicated that in Paul's time, it was even more concealing. The veil covered the head and the eyes, and they were the only place on the face that was revealed. You see it on the screen. The covering of the woman in Paul's time went from her head to her feet, and the only thing you saw was the eyes, what you see. And if she was uncovered, she was in danger, and it was an indication that she was not protected. That's how serious it was. The veil also was an indication that the woman was under someone's authority. It was a sign of inferiority. It was a sign of protection. A veil on a woman's head in biblical history indicated security and that she was protected and respected. Without her veil that you see on the screen, she was vulnerable to anyone disrespecting and insulting her. A woman's dignity would vanish if she did not have her veil, her covering on her. Therefore, her veil, the woman's veil, was all encompassing her as being an inferior. She was protected by a man and her chastity or refraining from sexual activity. Remember, Corinth was an immoral city. In the Jewish community and culture, Jewish women by law were inferior to men. In the Jewish community and culture, even today in the Orthodox Jewish community, this remains to be the norm. They remain in the belief as we do today, the interpretation that because women were created from Adam's rib in Genesis 2, 22 and 23, her purpose is to be a help me. It is not the help me role that the veil emerged from in the Jewish law. It is the fact that women came out of the rib. Here's the reason for the veil that was covered by the skin of the man. His rib was under his skin. It was covered by the skin. And that's how the woman was made. Therefore, in the Jewish culture, a woman must also move through life covered. Are you with me? Secondly, the Jewish woman in biblical history and in Paul being a Pharisaic Jew, Jewish women were a thing and considered to be property of her husband. She was considered to be like an animal, the way we were as enslaved people. And what we know was substantiated in the book stamped from the beginning. Study has shown that women had no say in worship and was segregated from men in an area or another part of the temple in the building. Just like we were put in the gallows or a balcony of the white church and it was the very segregated and racism manner of worship at St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia in 1787 that propelled the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Richard Allen, who was praying in a place and space that was not up in the gallows. 
It was not up in the gallery. And, it, and because of that, they, they pulled him up from his knees and, and while he was praying and he walked out of that church and birthed the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And from that day, historically, the AME Church has been a voice against racism and injustices. In the Jewish law, it was the custom and it was unthinkable that women should and would have equal footing with men. What the Apostle Paul was saying in verse number 10 is an indication that the reason for women to be veiled was that if they were not veiled, they would be a temptation to men. This scripture is directly connected to not only the culture, but to the situation, the lifestyle, the promiscuity, and the unprincipled people of the city of Corinth. The Apostle Paul writes with deliberate intent to suggest strict guidance to the early Christians in the city of Corinth to keep the young Christians from being lax and loose in their lifestyle. It was incorrect to take what Paul was writing out of context and make it applicable and relevant for the church back in the day and today in the 21st century. It is incorrect to take the writings of Paul and oppress women in the Christian church and force women to cover their heads with a hat or a doily before they can come to the altar and pray to the God of their salvation. The decision to wear a hat is your decision, but it should not be the law, and no woman should be, be belittled or unable to kneel at the altar or take communion because her head is not covered. If we get stuck in antiquated ways of doing church, we will lose our young people who are free and liberated and living in a technological age. And that is why we have a liberated and free-flowing worship experience that, is in, in this, in that although in this COVID-19 pandemic days, we can't come to, we miss it so. We live and we move spiritually in this house with a freedom of letting the Holy Spirit have its way. Are you with me? The Apostle Paul, after he addresses this issue, it goes, then goes into the relationship and partnership of man and women in verses 11 to 15, and he writes the following. In the Lord, however, a woman is not independent of man, nor is a man independent of woman. For as women came from men, so also man, <clears throat> excuse me, is born of women, of a woman, but everything comes from God. Just for yourself, it is proper for a woman to pray. Uh, it, is, it is proper for a woman to pray to God with a head covered. Does not at, at, at the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? Really? This day and age? But that, is, that, it, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a cover. You mean to tell me women can't? cut their hair and have beautiful styles. What Paul is initially saying is that there is a partnership of men and women. And in this context in biblical history, men and women are created by God, are so closely tied together, one cannot make it without the other. Subordination in this context is the relationship between a man and a woman as partners, and I dare say as married men and women, man and woman. This partnership can be a more fruitful and a blessing for both partners when one allows the other to be over one to be over the other. Doesn't mean that all times, at all times, the man is over the woman, or at times the woman is over the man. What it is saying is that in relationship, you become fluid and flexible. You may get this. You become fluid and flexible in relationships in Christ Jesus. Paul dealing with those times, I'm trying to bring you up to the 21st century. Wherever your strengths and your weaknesses are, you work together as partners. God equips each one of us with unique gifts and talents, and we are all, as men and women, fearfully and wonderfully made. None of us are like each other. None of us are the same. Of all the people in the world, none of us have the same fingerprints. 
to, to think that as a man and a woman created in the image of God to ever feel that one is better than the other, we all are created by God. And, and, and to feel that means therefore we, we put oppression on each other. In relationships and in marriage, it is a partnership. And by the mere fact that I am a woman and my husband is a man, we are different. Yet we all, as Paul says correctly, come from God. The formation of human beings is God's doing. The miracle birth launches from the creation of the seed in a man and the egg in the woman. And when they come together, the child is developed in the womb of a woman. Without God giving the seed in the man and the egg in the woman, there would be no creation of any human beings. God gave us as women and men a way by which we are collaborators, collaborators of recre recreating God's creation. And in this Advent season, we turn our attention to the miracle birth of Jesus in which God planted within the womb of the peasant girl Mary his seed by the Holy Ghost. The God we serve, the one who stepped into nothing and spoke everything into his existence, decided to fulfill his ultimate plan of bringing his creation. After the infiltration of sin, in and upon his creation in Genesis over 20, 20 years ago. The God of our salvation executed the plan from glory through the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mother Mary. And in him doing so, the process began to intimately bring us back to him as he had desired and intended. If God intended for his creation and for women to be oppressed and be less than what God wanted her to be, if God intended for women to be cast aside and be little because her head was not covered, if God intended for us because of the color of our skin and for women to be controlled or oppressed because she is a female, if God intended for any of us not to embrace our womanhood and our full potential and exercise our gifts and, our, and talents, if God intended for women not to embrace her gifts and her talents, then God would have not placed his seed, oh my God, in the womb of a woman. God was validating and giving significance in his creation and in a real sense, to women who did what he did through the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus the Christ. To women, what he was saying, he did it that way to affirm women, to affirm women because he decided to birth the son of God, his son, through a peasant girl named Mary. One who would have been considered as an insignificant peasant girl of Nazareth. And what God did, he gave significance to the, what society today thinks that we are insignificant. And what God did, he gave significance to church environments that squashed the gifts and talents of women and do their best to define what a woman should do and not do. I come before you, having lived and journeyed in the reality of being oppressed as a woman. Oftentimes I've been in circumstances and situations and churches that have tried to go up against what the Lord wanted me to do in my life. And the truth is, that some of you who are streaming on tonight, man or woman, your own journey, woman and man, you have had to deal with racism and sexism and evil roadblocks towards your purpose and passion. I want to thank you, Ebenezer. I'm talking to my Ebenezer church family right now. 
I want to thank you again for your love and, and for you embracing me as your co-pastor. And my prayer is that you are pleased with whatever my journey has been and you, you have helped me to evolve and we have all evolved and grown together in the things of God. Tonight, as the Lord directed in this Advent season and the season of COVID-19 pandemic that affects men and women and has no respect of gender or culture or color. In this season, where permission of expression of hatred and racism lurks in the dark and shows itself at opportune times and inopportune times, in this season, where disregard of what is right is being dismissed in every possible angle to up to try to upturn integrity, integrity, integrity and truth and honesty has been tried. In this season of Advent, when it should be joyous and, and celebrative as Christians, the devil is doing his best to steal our joy and oppress us as Christians. I come before you tonight unconventionally and willingly with Holy Ghost boldness to say that we must celebrate the Advent season and the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ that came over 220 years ago. I come before you on tonight declaring and decreeing that as believers, as men and women of God, and what God has ordained and executed through the Holy Spirit and Mother Mary in faith is our indication that the God we serve can do anything but fail. I come before you on tonight declaring that sometimes we get caught up and allow the enemy to shrink the magnitude of who the Lord is. We get caught up and put limitations on the power of Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the baby who was born in a manger. Against all odds, Jesus came forth from the womb just like each one of us are. But he came that we might be liberated and set free in our spirit from every form of sin and oppression and bondage, we are a people of God. A miracle, just like the baby Jesus coming forth from the womb. Don't let the enemy distract you and I. Don't let him have his way. We are trying to do our best in these days, and we must be conscious about, we must fully grasp and define who God is in our lives and embrace what he did for us. Just be willing, my sisters and brothers, with an open heart and soul and mind and seek his peace and his assurance that because of what he did from the beginning of time to this very moment, he is the one who is in control of all things. I come before you this evening, evening having been like yourselves streaming tonight through some things that I did not know how the Lord would move and work things out. But I come before you with my faith intact and I am reminded that when it comes down to life and living, that the only one who could help us get through and what miracle after miracle after miracle is the miracle of Jesus the Christ, the baby. Others have come and they have gone and have made an impact and difference in their own way. They have been enlightening and they have been insightful and they have been spiritual. But for me, the only one that I can depend upon and rely upon in the time of trouble, in the time of trials, in the time of today's realities of COVID-19 pandemic, in the time of racial injustice, in the time of racism, 
in time of sexism, in the time of lying and conniving and deceit and destruction and economic devastation and hunger and joblessness and homelessness and depression and anxiety and fear and the loss of lives and more. And in all of this that we are faced with, I refuse to let the reality of the times steal my joy and your joy. And so on tonight. We're going to be set free from the enemy. We are going to be free. Free from what people think. Free from what people are stuck in. Free from bondage. Free from looking in the wrong direction. Why? Because of God's love for us in sending his son Jesus through the womb of a peasant girl named G Mary. In this Advent service, we are going to, and see that we are going to celebrate the miracle and the birth of Jesus because we realize that in Christ Jesus, no matter what we are going through, the Lord God himself loves us and he is with us. We have been touched. We have been healed and totally free from sin. And everything that has tried to keep us from our purpose in our place in the kingdom of God, the wonder-working miracle power of the Holy Ghost will give us what we need to make and embrace everything that the Lord intended us to do for him, and we give him praise. This is the Apostle Paul's letters to the church. Oh, will you to give God praise wherever you are?